Venice, there's no place like it on Earth. A mirage between sea and sky. Built a thousand years ago on the water, the city of the Doges is a trip back in time. An ode to romanticism. But today, the city is in trouble. The danger comes not from the rising sea levels, but rather from the 28 million visitors who invade Venice every year. Behind the postcard, the dream is fracturing. Eight a.m. The famous Piazza San Marco is slowly waking up. At this time of day, Venice still belongs to lovers. Suddenly, just offshore, the monsters arrive. Every day, these cruise ships offload thousands of tourists into the city. Visitors who stay for only a few hours. Like these two couples. These cruise passengers have only seven hours to visit Venice. I love it, I love it. Oh, it's so romantic. Chantal and Jean-Luc take snapshots as best they can in the midst of the crowd. Wait, take it with your camera. A bit closer, I was taking your ear. A quick photo going past the Rialto Bridge, a mythical spot in Venice. And here they are in the Piazza San Marco. Despite the dense crowd, the magic works instantly. Oh, it's magnificent. Look at that. It's so beautiful. I didn't expect anything like this. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. So moving. <sighs> I'm so deeply moved. I can't believe it. But the clock is ticking. These tourists have to visit Venice on the run. At the end of this marathon, the two couples are ready to drop. We walked. We wanted to do everything. Everywhere. But time slipped by. We didn't realize it. One day in Venice is not enough. We need three days, I think. It makes us really want to come back and take some more time so we can see more of the surrounding area, you know, the islands and everything. During their day in Venice, these four pensioners have spent most of their time on the Piazza San Marco. This is the main problem with tourism in Venice. Millions of visitors flock to this open square, which is only 100 meters long. A tiny space that is now saturated. The Piazza San Marco has its own rules for handling these crowds. As the signs indicate, people are not allowed to sit down. They shouldn't eat or drink here, or they risk a fine of 500 euros. Instructions the tourists ignore. Another ban, feeding the thousands of pigeons, as their droppings are damaging the monuments. Here again, tourists don't care. They all want to take home the classic Venice photograph, the one with the pigeons. Food that you like it? Yeah, I think it's just part like they take pictures. No, it's part of taking yeah. picture. Ah. Yeah. 
they take it's a souvenir, you know, when you go home like that, you know, look at all the pictures that you got. So it means to say it came from the Lord, you know. Yeah. Okay. It's forbidden. Oh, I don't know, but people are feeding them. Yeah. I don't know. That's why you got choices to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> no. There are, you know, policemen around, you know, so they could say, do not take pictures, do not take take pictures, but they're not doing nothing, so this is say you could do. <laughs> Indeed, the policemen standing a few meters away don't seem concerned by the tourists disregarding the laws. You say to them it's not possible, because I saw a lot of person... There is too much a tourist. Ah. <laughs> okay. It's too difficult to, to go the, the, I'm, I'm in the sign uh, all the, the square and uh, uh, say the people that it is not uh, possible to feed the pigeon because uh, we have also uh, other uh, things to do. Ah, uh, okay. For the policeman, it's a losing battle. And rudeness is commonplace. To see the extent of the problem, we wait until the crowds have left. Six a.m. One of the world's most beautiful spots is an open-air garbage dump. It's like this every single day. This is a sorry sight for Luca De Pieri, a garbage collector who was born in Venice. Tourists are not respectful. They eat and then throw everything on the ground. It's turned into a picnic area. Unfortunately, I think there are far too many tourists in Venice, even if it's good in some ways, because we haven't managed to find efficient ways of controlling the flow of tourists. All these people need to eat, so unfortunately they come and hang out in the most beautiful places. Even on this square, right in front of a church. I don't understand it. Luca and his colleagues will spend an hour cleaning up the Piazza San Marco before the arrival of the next horde of tourists. Hundreds of kilos of collected waste are then carried off by hand. In Venice, nothing has done the same, even garbage collecting. In this labyrinth of small streets, the corners are sometimes hard to negotiate. Is it hard in these small streets? Yes, that's the problem with Venice. You have to carry all this rubbish using all kinds of carts, through narrow streets, filled with people, lots of tourists. Tourists in Venice generate 30,000 tonnes of garbage annually. This trash is then removed by boat. The complex logistics involved makes it three times more expensive than in Paris. In this city on the water, the tourist explosion causes other damage as well. Irreparable deterioration that most visitors can't even imagine. Matteo Secchi runs the largest association for the defense of Venice. The Grand Canal is the Champs-Élysées of Venice, with famous, elegant palaces lined up one after the other. There, that's where George Clooney got married. The Armani Hotel. Matteo, whose family has lived in Venice for several generations, is exasperated to see his city suffocating from tourism. 
Canal Grande. Right here, the Grand Canal has become a highway. By increasing the number of tourists, it increases the number of vaporettos, gondolas, taxis, transport boats. More tourists means more traffic, therefore more damage. The increasing number of even more powerful boats is a calamity for these ancient structures. When they built Venice, they couldn't have predicted that in seven centuries there'd be motorboats here. The waves caught by this traffic create a huge problem because they undermine the foundations of the palaces. Where? Under the water. The waves beat constantly against the foundations. All along the canals, the ebb and flow caused by the intense water traffic beats against the walls and ruins the facades. The impact of the water deteriorates the stones and loosens the bricks, creating holes under the surface. Even worse, the waves are dredging the bottom of the lagoon, unearthing the wooden pilings on which Venice is built. Salt water is infiltrating everywhere, through the cavities created by the backwash and seeping up the walls, damaging entire buildings. Another scourge is destroying the city's foundations, the cruise ships. 300 meters long, 60 meters wide, these floating cities are taller than the highest buildings. Every week, some 30 ocean liners cross the lagoon, weakening the city of the Doges even more. This afternoon, a number of Venetians have prepared a counter-offensive, a protest action on their own terms. The police are on high alert. For four years, the Committee Against Large Ships has been protesting their passage through the lagoon. Tommaso Cacciari is one of the movement's leaders. Born in Venice, this activist is outraged at the ocean liners destroying his city. When the ships sail by here, they displace 135,000 cubic meters of water. They therefore put a huge strain on the canal banks, on our homes and our monuments. Structures collapse. If you go to San Giorgio, where the ships have to make an S maneuver to leave, you can pull blocks of stones out with your hands. They're destroying our city and making money, and it's the citizens, all of us, who have to pay for the damage. The protest takes place on the water. Dozens of small boats are waiting for the ocean liners that are moored just a few hundred meters away to cast off. Raise the flags higher! When the ships go by, we're going to try and stop them with our small boats. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. David and Goliath. The signal is given. The cruise ship is getting closer. The demonstrators are going to try to interfere with its passage and symbolically throw eggs at it. Stand here. No, no, mette it giù. Mette it giù. So that you can throw them a really long way. The police intervene to prevent the protesters from getting too close. Tommaso waits for the right moment to launch the attack. Hey, look how I can mess you around, Coast Guard, look. Wait, wait! Okay, go! Higher, higher! Okay. 
Go on, take good aim. That was a good one. We hit the boat. It's just an egg, but we hit it. The activists get as close as they can to the floating building. That's dangerous. Move away. This is my home here. They're the dangerous ones. The liner steams on without even slowing down. It's hard to fight against the cruise ship multinationals, which generate 300 million euros turnover every year. Venice is endangered, but the authorities don't even have the funds to protect it. And with good reason. Most of the tourists who invade the city don't spend a single night here. They don't pay any visitor's tax to the city to pay for the upkeep of the monuments. This woman city councillor is responsible for public works. One year ago, the city launched one of its largest restoration projects, the iconic Rialto Bridge, worn down by the incessant passage of millions of visitors. This 16th century structure has not been restored in 40 years. The scaffolding runs along its facade right up to its roof. It's a unique opportunity to be here because once the work is finished, you won't be able to climb onto the top of the Rialto Bridge anymore. You'll only be able to see it from below. Very few of us will be this fortunate again. The renovation will take 18 months. These stone cutters have dismantled the balustrade to repair all the damaged parts in the marble. Cost of the job, 5 million euros. Is money from tourism financing this work? No, no, no. No, no. the visitor's tax that tourists pay is not used to fund renovations in the city. There is just enough to pay for the services the tourists themselves use. We have a one-day type of tourism that doesn't bring anything to Venice while using the city services. It's a controversial issue here, the issue of the financial cost, but also that of invasion. Tourism is an incredible resource, but managing it is problematic for us. The city had to appeal to a private sponsor to fund the work. In exchange, this clothing label has a 12-meter-high advertisement on the most photographed site in Venice. The city of the Doges accepts all these problems because tourism is a vital sector in Venice. The only one flourishing despite the economic crisis. It generates 30,000 direct jobs, including Barbara Tosatos. She's a guide on the Piazza San Marco. Barbara is one of the Venetians who supports tourism, Venice's only economic activity. We don't have anything else in Venice. Tourism is what keeps Venice alive. Everyone depends on tourism. My dentist depends on tourism. I'm a guide, I depend on tourism. The restaurants, the hotels, everyone in Venice depends on tourism. This former history professor switched to tourism 30 years ago. When she began, Venice had 65 guides. Now there are nearly 300. 
Barbara loves her city and wants to show people the real Venice, the one outside the Piazza San Marco. This morning, you'll be immersed in daily life. What's unique about Venice, apart from its beauty and its monuments, is the way people live. So try to stay on the right in the small streets. Otherwise, you'll block people's way. If not, you can follow the tourist routes, but it's not interesting. We're going to explore around the small streets. This is the real Venice. The little canals, the small bridges, little balconies filled with flowers, the roof terraces. Barbara leads her group down the tiniest passages and into countless hidden little courtyards. This is not a campiello. It's a corte. La corte dei milion. Most of all, she wants people to understand the Venetian lifestyle. Venice is not a small town. Venice is a big village. I have friends who meet here every night for drinks at 7 p.m. sharp. And over there, they meet for drinks at 7.30. This town really leaves a mark on people. It's like a village. And that's what's magnificent. It's magnificent. And it's unique. Her message to tourists? Don't behave as if you were in some conquered land. Let this man by. He's a real Venetian. <laughs> and it's an important one, because many Venetians are nearing a breaking point. You know, Venetians are like pandas. There aren't many of them. Like Christina Giussani, a bookseller. Christina lives in the real Venice, the one with the small hidden courtyards and the quiet little streets, just a few hundred meters from the Piazza San Marco. To get to work, this bookseller has to walk through the tourist areas. Venetians like Christina immediately stand out from the crowd for their decisive quick pace, moving against the flow of tourists. This is a tunnel that I nearly always avoid. There are so many people, it's very narrow, really complicated to walk through. I hate this street. For Venetians, every trip they take in their daily lives is a nightmare. It's normal to have a busy street. But look, you can't move. It's best to avoid it if you're in a hurry. We're always on the run because we have to go to the bank, we're running errands, but we're stuck in the crowds. It's complicated for us. Venetians live in a state of siege. There are just 56,000 residents compared to the 28 million visitors that are everywhere, even on their public transportation, the Vaporettos. Some days when I get on a Vaporetto, I get off at the following stop, because I can't stand it. I think I may have sent several people to the hospital. Really? I'm joking. But when I say please, and they still don't let me pass, and I've got a shopping trolley with me, I push feet, legs, too bad. I'm polite, I'll explain if I have to. But if I'm tired, if I've been running or had a hard time getting through the Piazza San Marco, then I complain. <laughs> Christina complains, but she belongs to several associations that propose solutions. She thinks every effort must be made to limit the number of tourists in Venice. Even a radical measure charging an entrance fee to the Piazza San Marco. There is a proposal to deal with the city's flow of tourists, close the Piazza San Marco and make a museum of the piazza and the surrounding area. 
so that people pay to visit this district. It would be the only public square in the world charging an entrance fee. Don't you think that this square is unique? I don't know how many other squares in the world have so many visitors every year. If it becomes a museum, we could better manage the number of people. It's reasonable. It's an interesting proposal. Closing the piazza is a difficult project to implement. Some residents even want to charge an entrance fee to the entire city. Persistent but unworkable ideas. In the meantime, exasperated Venetians keep tourists at arm's length, even during the most spectacular festivals. On the first Sunday in September, one of Venice's biggest events is about to take place, the historic regatta. In this gym on the other side of the city, Venetians meet up to get ready. This city councillor is the head of the celebrations. These people are disguised so that we can leap 500 years back in time. Our duty is not only to show what we were and what we're proud of, but also to say that even if our lifestyles have changed, we're still part of the great history of the great city of Venice. It's a return to the 15th century, a time when Venice, the Serenissima, dominated Europe. Venetians are still proud of this opulent era. <laughs> there aren't any tourists in this troupe. The event is not even publicized on the streets of the city, deliberately so. It's private. Here, you see what Venetians experience when they're away from the tourists. The tourist who takes over and wants to decide everything is a tourist to be avoided. If we started to change and accommodate them, we'd no longer be true Venetians. It would all be just a meaningless masquerade. Two hours later, Venetians are lining up along the Grand Canal. The luckiest ones are at the windows of their palaces. Others are packed into boats the best place to get a view. The historic procession opens the festivities. But everyone is waiting for the boat races, where the oarsmen row standing up. This is the most popular sport in Venice. Every year, the city's best teams compete, cheered on by their supporters. There are very few tourists among the spectators, except these three French visitors can't really understand what's going on. They're the names of districts or something. What's the word on there? Mauvremont? Or the names of streets, I don't know. They told me they do it on purpose, so that not many tourists come. What do you think about that? It's a pity. It's too bad, we're here to discover Venice. On the other hand, it's not a bad idea. I can understand why. It's a shame, because it's part of the Venetian culture. So, well, it's too bad they don't advertise it more. We're here to discover Venice. So, I don't see why we couldn't watch this type of event. But at the same time, if people knew about it, I'm not sure that everyone could fit along the canals. So what the best thing to do is, I don't know. Therein lies the dilemma. How to make a living off tourism without losing your soul. For Christina, the Venetian, in some neighborhoods it's already too late. Vice president of the Shopkeepers Association, this bookseller has seen all the local businesses disappear one after another. That was a historic toy store for 50 years. And this bridge is still called the Bridge of Toys by the Venetians. Then it was a shoe shop, and um, that lasted for two years. And now it's cheap souvenirs. Tourist shops have invaded Venice. 
Here is where the disaster begins. That was a store. There were the two others opposite. It was a famous fabric store, and I used to buy fabric here for my sewing. This one's closed. Nothing but souvenirs. Bags made in China. There's still a baker and a fruit and vegetable shop, but we used to have everything we needed. The butcher, food stores. This street changed overnight, suddenly. You go by in the morning and at night it had changed. It's shocking to me. Over the last five years, all over the city, the number of stores selling junk for less than five euros has skyrocketed. Cheap leather bags, fake traditional masks. Souvenirs sold as if they were made in Italy, all identical but rarely genuine. The ultimate symbol of this counterfeit market is the famous Murano glass. Lights, vases, figurines and jewelry at unbeatable prices. How many of these objects were truly made on the island of Murano, just opposite Venice? Michele Valsecchi has a store specializing in Murano glass located just steps from the Piazza San Marco. They have showed this one. An official expert, Michele knows the counterfeit market well. Today, nearly 80% of the glass sold in Venice and Murano is not made in Murano. It's imported glass, made in Italy or elsewhere in Europe. It's machine-made, not handmade. That's proof that it doesn't come from Murano. In Venice, eight in ten glass objects are therefore fake Muranos. To get a better look, we do a little shopping with a hidden camera. This shop in the city centre looks like the real thing. We go in and buy this horse marked Murano Glass. Mm -hmm. Vetro di Murano. Uh, yes, it's made in Murano. It's made in Murano? Okay. It's blowing glass. We mm -hmm. call it Aventurina, this kind of glass with the, the oxide, the metal oxide inside. Mm -hmm. And it's made in the island uh, of Murano? The island, yes. I go take it uh, now okay. to the island. If we are to believe this dealer, this 29 euro horse is a genuine Murano. Thanks. In this other, much more luxurious shop, we choose this small, very expensive vase. This little vase is 60 euros with a small discount. We only deal in Murano glass. We are intrigued by a name written in gold letters on the vase. What's that there? That's the signature of the master, the man who made the vase. I'm not sure if that master is still working. Do these objects really come from Murano? Here's Michele's verdict. So this piece is very poorly made. The details are crude. Looking at the base, the workmanship is not perfect. Usually the base, underneath, should be perfectly smooth. To demonstrate, Michele compares it to a genuine Murano horse. On this one, for example, you can see that the base is entirely smooth. Murano glass is an artistic glass. All the details are meticulously crafted. The mane, the ears, the mouth. This is the work of a master glass worker with years of experience. And this is not. Next, we look at the vase from the luxury shop. This is classic glass from Tuscany. 
It's too regular, proof that it was machine-made, especially the rim. You can see that the circle is perfect. By hand, that's impossible. So it doesn't come from Murano because the glass workers there only work by hand. And then this signature is absolutely meaningless. Is it possible that they invent a signature? Yes, I could write my name. You could write your name. Anyone could write their name. The ultimate in deception. At 60 euros, the fake Murano is more expensive than the real thing. A small vase like this one, a genuine Murano, would cost 30 or 40 euros. This fake vase is really too expensive. There is only one official label guaranteeing the authenticity. This label indicating the workshop number. Beyond the aggrieved tourists, this counterfeiting is slowly killing the Murano craftsmen. Every week, Michele goes to the island to buy merchandise from the workshops. Imperio Rossi and Mario Constantini are two of the island's last remaining glassmakers. Very quickly, performing precise rapid movements, Mario transforms this piece of molten glass into a horse's head. These glassmakers use the same tools and techniques as those of Murano's first glassmakers. Techniques that date from the Middle Ages. It takes decades of practice to master this skill. Mario started at the age of 11. If you're talented, it takes at least 20 years to become a master. But if you don't have the ability, you'll remain an assistant your entire life. What do you think about counterfeiting? Unfortunately, it hurts our image, because people don't distinguish between the Chinese-made objects and ours. But the difference is enormous. The Chinese products are rubbish, and Murano are... This ancestral profession is now endangered because there are not enough young people. If there aren't any more glass workers, mathematically we'll disappear. The job's too exhausting. Today they stay in school until they're 25. In the past, you were already in the workshop at the age of 10 or 12. One quarter of the workshops have closed in the last 15 years. Only 150 remain in Murano. Under the pressure of mass tourism, the historic city of Venice is gradually losing its authenticity and becoming a theme park. Venetians no longer even live behind these walls. Currently, one in every four homes is rented to tourists, a world record. Multiple agencies have been created in recent years to manage them, like that of Marco Malafante, an English-speaking Venetian businessman. A member of a long-standing Venetian family, Marco has become rich through tourism, like a handful of Venetians. He now manages some 30 apartments, most of which are located near the Piazza San Marco. We manage 10 properties here. Uh, we will see one today, which is one of our latest uh, and uh, amongst the ones on the top of our range, of our, of our offer. On the top floor of this entirely renovated palace, Marco manages a 120 square meter duplex. 
two living rooms, two bedrooms, marble bathrooms, decorated in pure Venetian style. Of course, it's uh, there are antiques and original pieces of uh, furniture, and this is very nice and typical of Venice. Uh, uh, nice houses when you have this uh, kind of uh, symbol like that, this kind of uh, uh, design. But uh, it's uh, it's an old house, 16th century house, and uh, it has quite a lot of success because it match, as you will see also upstairs, um, new features or uh, modern features together with uh, a very good and tasteful uh, layout of the house. This duplex is only rented to tourists, to people who can pay up to 400 euros a day, especially to enjoy its rooftop terrace. The owners do very well from it. It's a quite a solid investment. It's a town where you can't build anymore. That makes immediately a point. It is profitable uh, in the way that you, owe, you still have the property, which has a value that increases year on year. Bad year is 3%, good year 5 6%, which is still good. And uh, then you have uh, a, a return from uh, the holiday renters for, the, for our management. A return that is uh, sometimes uh, uh, double to triple what you can earn if you would have rent it uh, to uh, a normal residential contract. Okay. This rental brings in an average of 9,000 euros every month. A rent that's beyond the reach of most Venetians. More apartments for tourists means fewer that are available for residents. Finding a place to live in Venice is becoming harder and harder. This is the other major battle for Tommaso Cacciari, the anti-cruise ship activist. With members of his association, he helps families like that of Nadia Taratana, her two children and her partner, Nicola Usardi, to find housing. They quite simply squat an apartment and openly accept responsibility for it. Nicola takes us to visit the place where he's been living for four years. A three-room apartment with rudimentary facilities. This is the bedroom. We have about 70 square meters, which is a good size for a family like ours. An apartment like this usually rents for 1,000 to 1,200 euros a month. So for people like us, it's very hard to stay in Venice with such high rents. In this small town of 56,000 residents, real estate prices are the same as those in Rome, Italy's capital. It's impossible for this couple who work in the tourist sector and earn together 1,500 euros a month to find suitable housing. I'd be happy to pay rent, but I can't put out 800 euros for a 20 square meter apartment. What can I do? The children need their space, and we as parents do too. We could go into debt, which is not okay. I don't pay, and I won't pay to live poorly. I'm here and that's that. In Venice, 60 families occupy apartments illegally, and the town lets them do it. Proof, according to Tommaso, that mass tourism is doing more harm than good to the population. It's not true that tourism brings wealth and well-being. This model of tourism has boosted the real estate market to excessive levels. That's why there are so many illegally occupied homes in Venice. They're all Venetians who want to fight back and don't want to give in to the speculation. They resist because they just want to keep being Venetians. But not many of them can hold out. In recent years, the city has been emptying out at an unexpected rate. In 20 years, it has lost 20% of its residents, most of them young. Inside the city itself, 
the remaining population is aging. To draw attention to this attrition, several hundred Venetians staged a funeral for Venice. It was a symbolic burial to alert public opinion to the programmed death of their city. Matteo Secchi planned this funeral. Since then, he has organized regular events in support of Venice's survival. One of his most recent battles was to save the last hospital. This is the last remaining hospital in Venice. They tried to close it a few years ago because there are fewer and fewer residents. The problem for us, but also for tourists, is that the closest hospital will be on the mainland, more than an hour's drive away. In 2011, Matteo's association brought together several hundred demonstrators, and they were able to save the hospital. But for how long? For me, if they close the hospital, it's a death sentence for the population. A city without a hospital is a city bound to die. The end of public services and small businesses, a dwindling population. In time, Venice could become a ghost town, a mere backdrop. This threat terrifies the Venetians, like this group to which Matteo belongs, which strongly advocates an eternal Venice. Afraid of being forgotten, afraid of disappearing, they're carrying out symbolic acts aimed at raising awareness at a global level. As in September, when every year they raise the flag of the winged lion, which represents the past splendor of the most serene republic. They fly the banner atop this fort, which stands at the entrance to the lagoon as a warning to tourists. It's an act of resistance and pride, and a way to show that we belong to our city, which is represented by the flag. It's like a dog that pees to mark its territory. We welcome everyone, provided that all these people respect the town and its residents. These Venetians, who have become a minority in their own city, are falling back on their tradition and their identities, the last vestiges of the city of yesteryear. I'm very afraid. <laughs> I'm very afraid for Venice. It's not just because I'm Venetian, because I was actually born on the mainland, but since I got married and came here, 42 years ago, it has become my city. I would like to continue to live here and to die here. I would like to speak directly to the tourists, tell them that the only solution is to allow Venice to reclaim its human scale, which no longer exists. The 30 million tourists don't provide us with any benefits. All of us, at the international level, have to save Venice so that it once again becomes a welcoming place, so that it is once again a city that people love, because that's not the case anymore. To protect Venice, tourists must learn to travel another way. Visit the city on foot and not by boat, Take time to explore beyond the usual tourist itineraries and blend into the city 
to respect the beauty of the sites and the peace and quiet of its residents. A responsible type of tourism is crucial because at this rate, in 10 years, the number of visitors will exceed 50 million.